Hello everyone and welcome to the second video in my series but not really a series entitled Recreating Historical Craft which I find interesting that so far have been of Soviet origin but the series will be in no means limited to Soviet craft going forward in the future. That title is definitely a work in progress. Today we'll be looking at recreating the moon mission that never was. It was Russia's answer to America's Apollo program, and it's a mission I haven't really seen recreated all that much in KSP, and it's definitely an interesting subject. Let's just talk about this rocket, which was called the N1L3. Now while aesthetically this rocket I'm using doesn't look too much like the real one, which has a shape that's very hard to faithfully recreate in stock KSP, it does have the correct number of engines and stages and all that good stuff. It's funny that it's not really recreated by players as much as the Saturn V is, since it's perhaps the most Kerbal rocket ever made. You see, the N1 was originally designed to send manned vehicles on Venus and Mars flybys, missions that involve much lighter payloads than a lunar surface return. It was therefore not really that well suited for manned lunar landing missions due to the much heavier payload requirements, but the Soviets managed to get around this problem by doing things the Kerbal way. They added more boosters. Six more, to be precise, by increasing the N1's already very high engine count from 24 to 30 in its first stage alone. Its first stage actually remains the most powerful rocket stage ever built. By comparison, the Saturn V, which was capable of carrying significantly heavier payloads to orbit by the way, had just five engines in its first stage. Another thing that makes the N1 particularly Kerbal is the fact that every single one of them exploded. And as we saw past the 15 km mark, we can detach Block A, which was the name given to the first stage of the N1, and fire up the eight engines in Block B, or Stage 2. Yep, even this stage still has eight engines. I'm sure you can begin to piece together why the Soviets never actually made it to the moon using this rocket. Yes, you could put it down to sort of, you know, poor government decisions, mismanagement, economic barriers, or any number of other factors, but it all really boils down to the N1 rocket itself. Yes, it was far more powerful than the Saturn V, or any other rocket really to this day, but the way it achieved this power was utterly ludicrous. 30 engines in just the first stage is absolutely insane. It's more than almost any Kerbal rocket I've ever designed, and don't forget that in Kerbal Space Program, engines are 100% reliable. Look at the Saturn V. It's engine design seems incredibly simple by comparison, but even it consisted of over 6 million components, and if just 0.1% of these failed, catastrophic failure would result. Looking back at the N1, it's no wonder it never actually completed any of its four flights. But enough of this, pish posh, we need to get back to the flight, and we are getting towards the end of Block V, which is the third stage, and its purpose is to circularize our orbit. In fact, we're going to jettison it, now our periapsis is at 29 kilometers, and our apoapsis is at 104 kilometers, just because this means it will fall back to Kerbin and burn up and not leave any debris in space. And there goes the launch escape system, which actually turned out to be one of the most uh, successful aspects of the failed Soviet moon program. You see, when they were testing the orbital module, two of the uh, launches for it actually failed, and they ended up using the launch escape system, which proved to be successful. It's just a shame the rest of the rocket wasn't as successful. <laughs> so we'll just time warp ahead a little bit and do a small f uh, burst of energy with that transfer engine. Um, doesn't take much to get a circularized. Like I say, most of the uh, orbit insertion was completed using the three ascent stages. And there we have it. We are in a more or less stable circular orbit. Well, it's completely stable, but it's more or less circular. And here we can have a good look at the actual contents of the payload there. So you can see the lander is sort of sitting there in the middle, and we have our orbital command module at the front. I'll save you the painful process of me setting up a maneuver node and just cut straight to the actual... Uh, curb into MUN transfer burn. Now there was a small mistake on my part here, I didn't use quite enough fuel for that transfer stage. It doesn't matter because I used too much fuel for the stage above it, so I just pumped some of the fuel uh, into the main transfer stage tank. So if you do choose to download this craft file from the description, you'll need to do that. It's very simple. Uh, the, the next stage from this one consists of two fuel tanks, a big one and a small one. Just dump the entire contents of the small fuel tank into this stage and then you'll be fine. And there is the completion of 
block G. Um, so we can just detach this stage. Now you'll notice how we're currently on a collision course with the MUN. That way that booster there will just crash into it and not leave any debris in orbit. And now we're just going to do some small puffs with our reaction control system to raise our periapsis to a safe altitude, which in this case I've gone for 20 kilometers. Anyway, it is at this point that I'm sure some of you may be wondering, Matt, you careless cretin, you forgot to add solar panels. But worry not, dear viewers, the real mission would not have used solar panels either, instead using fuel cells to generate all the power. And fuel cells are available to us in stock KSP now, so we can make use of them. I have some batteries tucked away in that metal fairing, um, so... That's where those are, and that's where the electricity will be stored itself. You know, it's funny, in the end, I kind of went a bit overkill with the electric charge. You'll notice we have an electric charge of, what does that say, 4,100. So, yeah, we didn't even need the fuel cells, but, you know, we have them. And we do end up having more fuel than we really need in this mission anyway, so it's not like we couldn't have used them if we did need them. Um, you would have noticed me throughout this mission, actually, dropping lots of fuel tanks despite them having... Uh, lots of fuel le left in them, and that's just because I'm dropping them in the places the intended moon rocket would have dropped them, just for the sake of historical accuracy. But here we are bringing down our periapsis to put us in a nice circular orbit around the moon using Block D, which will also double as the first stage of our lunar lander as well. Anyway, it was at this point I decided that uh, it might be a nice idea that well, just going back into the past for a second, I recreated the Apollo mission a while ago, and, and in that video I visited my MUN base. So I thought it'd be cool to do that again with the Soviet lander, and land it next to the carcass of the Apollo descent stage. So now we're parked in orbit around the MUN and ready to land, we can transfer Valentina Kerman, whose namesake is actually from the first female cosmonaut, a title set by the Soviet Union, uh, into the lunar lander. Unlike Apollo, there is no way of transferring between the command module and the the lander directly and so she will need to perform a spacewalk in order to board it. She will also be doing the landing alone. In order to save weight the Soviet lander could only have one cosmonaut and it also used the same engine for both landing and taking off from the moon unlike the Apollo lander again to save weight. Now with the actual design of my ship I tried to mimic the overall aesthetic of the Russian lander but it was kind of very circular and curvy in shape which is quite difficult to achieve using KSP's selection of cylinders and girder parts. We'll use the remainder of Block G's fuel to perform our initial deceleration before switching to the lander's own propulsion system for the rest. Anyway, here we are decelerating and I ended up kind of just sort of brute forcing the surface base encounter just because I knew I had more than enough fuel for what I really needed to do. I was kind of a bit sort of, well, brute forcing it I suppose. I quite like using that term. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we are just sort of playing around with our vertical and horizontal speed, uh, getting our landing. Before I made videos, I used to try and play this game a bit more uh, correctly, I suppose, and so I would actually calculate uh, whenever I needed to do rescue missions or landing at very specific spots by applying a little bit of trigonometry um, with maneuver nodes. Scott Manley did a great tutorial on this, and I don't really feel like I need to reiterate what he's already said, so if you wanted to um, know, learn how to land at things properly rather than using this uh, terribly inefficient method of doing things, then I suggest you check that out. Anyway, I feel like we're pretty much landing and I haven't once touched upon the actual design of this lander, so I better just talk about that very briefly. Um, we're doing most of our deceleration using that small spark engine. We also have those top-mounted uh, attitude adjusters, which um, are toggled using the RCS controls, and I've just been using them for a little bit of extra kick of deceleration to help make my landing a little bit more accurate, although this thing doesn't actually need them to properly land on the surface if you feel like recreating this mission a little bit more accurately than I decided to. But uh, yeah, this is the lander. So although the specifics on planned activity while on the lunar surface, um, for the real one I'm talking about, remain pretty much not really that well known, uh, the small size and limited payload capacity of the uh, Soyuz lander uh, compared to the Saturn V and Apollo lander meant that, you know, not much in the way of scientific instrumentation could have been performed. Uh, could have been carried there. Um, most likely the cosmonaut would have just planted the Soviet flag on the moon, collected a few sort of surface samples, taken photographs, all that shebang, maybe deploy a few small scientific packages, but long duration missions and things like lunar rovers, you know, all those other activities that were done on the later Apollo missions, they would just not have been possible using the Soviet lander, sadly. But yeah, we can just send Val out on a quick EVA moonwalk to the base, say hello to everyone, check out the Apollo carcass there, and then we can just plant our flag, 
and once we've collected our science we can board the module again and get ready to depart and head back to the orbiting command module. And so with the primary objective of this mission completed we can think about getting back to the command module in orbit around the moon or MUN I guess in this case. We begin our ascent by detaching from the landing segment and aiming for the LOK command module. The LOK was the uh, name of the real command module. I know it's cut away now, but you may have noticed that sort of weird fairing structure I built into it. That was just to help mimic the shape of the actual lander. You may have also noticed a junior size docking port at the top of the lander can. Just because although we'll be docking with the command module once we're back in orbit, uh, at the front of the command module, you know, the same way uh, the Apollo landers docked with the front of their command module. I, I hope that made sense. We still can't transfer directly straight from the lander into the command module via a tunnel we still need to perform another spacewalk to get back into the crew cabin i know you can still technically transfer through junior docking ports in this game but you know it doesn't really make sense since a kerbal would have a pretty hard time fitting through a junior docking port sized hole anyway you'll notice me sort of tactfully avoiding the horrendousness that was my uh command module encounter just because again I knew I had surplus fuel and when I know I have surplus fuel I just tend to take the brute force approach rather than planning things economically so I apologize for that um, but I also don't and with that here we are preparing to dock with the Soyuz command module. Now this will be the last time we have the Soyuz 7K LOK to give it its full name command module and the LK lander uh, together in all their glory. After this we'll be detaching the lander once Valentina is all safe inside the command module and leaving it in orbit because of course it is just dead weight at this point. You may have noticed by now that we only have two Kerbals conducting this mission. This is because unlike Apollo the Soviet craft only had capacity for two cosmonauts on the mission. One to operate the lander and one to remain in the Soyuz command module. You know rather than the Apollo's three crew members. But there we are, we're just planning our manoeuvre node now to get ourselves back to Kerbin and now that both our Kerbals are snug inside the LOK we have detached the lander and can take a good look at the Soyuz craft itself. Uh, now the Soyuz command module is similar in size to the Apollo 1 dimension wise uh, but there are a number of differences. The LOK consists of three modules, we have the orbital section, descent vehicle and the equipment module. In this case the orbital section is that small lander can at the front, the descent module is the, the, the middle bit with the heat shield I guess and the equipment module is just the bit with all the actual propulsion systems. Now although from a strict dimension standpoint this thing is similar in size to Apollo CSM command module, uh, this thing does have the aforementioned problems of having a lower crew capacity and not having the transfer tunnel to allow uh, the cosmonauts to go straight from the orbital command module to the lander itself, they have to perform a spacewalk. But regardless of all of that, this mission is coming to an end. We detached the service and orbital modules and we braced for re-entry. The real Soviet mission was planned to use a skip re-entry to ensure it landed in the Soviet Union, but this is very hard to do in KSP without things like wings to generate lift, so we've just gone straight in. And that's it, the moon mission that never was. Catastrophic failure after catastrophic failure after catastrophic failure eventually resulted in the Soviet program being brought to an end, with the program being terminated de facto in 1974 and then officially cancelled in 1976. The whole thing was kept a secret until the details were published in 1990 and two unused yet flight ready N1 rockets were scrapped, uh, with their remains ending up being used as shelters and storage sheds, though the boosters themselves were destroyed by the USSR in an attempt to cover up the failed moon missions. There were roughly 70 engines left over from the program that ended up in storage and these actually ended up being incorporated into both the Soyuz 3 rocket in 2004 and then in 2013 Soyuz 2-1V launch as well so you know things did come out of this mission that ended up being successful but yes I hope you enjoyed. Um, videos you can see at the moment top left is the first episode of this you know, so far only Soviet vehicles series, it's the Ekrana plan. And then top right is the construction of the MUN base, which you saw featured in this video. And the bottom right is one that is apparently personally selected for you, for you and you alone. So, you know, I hope you enjoy that. 
and thank you for watching. 